Welcome to this session of Literary Criticism, where we would look into Chapter 1 of Principles of Literary Criticism. Before we move into the deliberation, let us begin with an introduction to John Crow Ransom. John Crow Ransom in The New Criticism, published in 1941, insists on beginning his book with a discussion of new criticism with Mr. Richards. The new criticism very nearly began with him, he says. In terms of the influence Richards exerted on the minds of young critics and writers of the time, it could be inferred that Richards had been the most important theoretician in the first half of the 20th century. He published three volumes of poetry but he is remembered primarily as a literary critic and teacher, not as a poet. Richards was a scholar of semantics and along with the philosopher, writer and editor Charles Ogden, he formulated basic English. The Meaning of Meaning published in 1923, written in collaboration with Ogden is an important contribution to linguistics. Principles of Literary Criticism in 1924 was followed by Science and Poetry in 1926. Practical Criticism published in 1929 and Coleridge on Imagination in 1934. Richards rejected positivist criticism, something which he had seen in the earlier session which considers that human achievements have some bearings on the psychology of an individual, the period in which he lives and the race to which he belongs. Richards is of the view that the literary text should be studied independent of these three factors. He was fascinated by the developments in psychology and wanted to evaluate art in terms of the state of mind induced by it. He promoted a psychological theory of value, which has now become outdated due to later researches in psychology. We now brief the chapters in Richard's principles of literary criticism. He mentions that criticism is the endeavor to, I quote, discriminate between experiences and to evaluate them, unquote it would be impossible to distinguish between the experiences and the procedures of evaluation without the knowledge of the nature of experience, the theories of valuation and communication. Richards mentions that modern day critics believe in exciting the emotions in the mind appropriate to their subject matter. The chapters in this book perform the dual functions of providing an interesting commentary on the state of contemporary culture and acting as a new and powerful instrument in inculcating critical insight. Most of the chapters included in the text provide a psychological background to specific accepts of aesthetic appreciation and communication. The 35 chapters in the text are, we just move on to a brief idea of the 35 chapters, the chaos of critical theories, which is the first one, the second, the phantom aesthetic state, third, the language of criticism, fourth, communication and the artist, fifth, the critics concerned with value, sixth, value as an ultimate idea. 7th, a psychological theory of value, 8th, art and morals, 9th, actual and possible misapprehensions, 10th, poetry for poetry's sake, 11th, a sketch for a psychology, 12th, pleasure, 13th, emotion and the co-anesthesia, 14th, memory, 15th, attitudes, 16th, the analysis of a poem, 17th rhythm and meter, on looking at a picture is the 18th chapter, the 19th chapter is sculpture and the construction of form, 20th the impasse of musical theory, 21 
a theory of communication, 22nd, the availability of the poet's experience, 23rd, Tolstoy's infection theory, 24th, the normality of the artist, 25th, badness in poetry, 26th, judgment and divergent readings, 27th, levels of response and the width of appeal, 28th, the allusiveness of modern poetry, 29th, permanence as a criterion, 30th, the definition of a poem, 31st, art, play and civilization, 32nd, the imagination, 33rd, truth and revelation theories, 34th, the two uses of language and the last 35th chapter is poetry and beliefs. This was followed by an appendix wherein there are two parts to it, appendix A and appendix B. Appendix A is on value and appendix B is on Mr. Eliot's poetry. Let us now summarize the arguments as a whole presented by Richards in Principles of Literary Criticism before delving into chapter 1. Richards is principally concerned with obtaining value from the arts, the emphasis being given to the art of poetry. The concern for the attainment of value from poetry forms the foundation of his principal critical and artistic pronouncements. Richards begins the book by pointing out that there are several impediments that prevent valid criticism. Experimental aesthetics as Richards terms it is the attempt to render human tastes and actions conducive to laboratory examination. Criticism is so involved in pursuing significant aspects of arts that it disregards the value of art. The use of indistinct vocabulary mars proper understanding of critical concepts. He cites the instance where critics talk about objects of art as if they possess certain attributes whereas what they should point out is that the objects trigger effects in us. The word effects is important. To overcome these obstacles Richards emphasizes the need to understand the nature of experience initially and then formulate a convincing theory of assessment and communication in the arts. Richards proceeds to approach the first topic which is experience that is analyzed within the framework of psychology. Chapter 11 titled A Sketch for a Psychology describes the mind that forms a part of the nervous system where sense impulses are influenced by various stimuli. Human response to the stimuli rests on the needs of the body at the specific moment. This would mean that the basis of aesthetic experience would lie in the impulses that arise in the mind as a result of various stimuli. These stimuli may be both new and independent or associated with earlier experience. Several facets of experience such as memory, emotion, co-anesthesia and attitude are detailed in separate chapters. Richards delineates another feature of experience which is the difference between the experiences of the poet and an ordinary man in chapter 12 the poet's experience. He points out that range, delicacy and freedom are the three parameters that decide the nature of relationships that can be made from experience. The ability to make available the experience of the artist decides the poet's ability to remain in a specific state of mind when required. The artist possesses a higher degree of vigilance. Vigilance means the capacity to organize the impulses satisfactorily and completely. The poet is better equipped to make use of his experience. After elucidating the cause, nature and effect of experience, Richards concentrates on the two other aspects, value and communication. 
the arts are the storehouses of recorded values says Richards. A critic should not be concerned with value and morality. In chapter 7, a psychological theory of value, Richards defines value as anything that satiates a desire within an individual. Additional value is achieved when any desire is sacrificed to another. Value defined in relation to desire is the exercise of impulses and the fulfillment of their desires. The artist is more apprehensive about values than anybody else. He constantly engages in recording and disseminating the experiences which he thinks are more valuable to him. He would be the only person to have valuable experiences to record. He would be better equipped to organize the significant and trivial impulses that are a part of experience. The poet would be able to lay the foundation of morality because morality depends on value from life. This means that Richard denounces the art for art's sake theory of poetry, a theory which refutes external values in art. Richards advocates the harmony between real life and the world of poetry for any severance would result in imbalance, narrowness and incompleteness in advocators of the aesthetic theory. He goes on to tell us about values which is equally important. Values according to Richards can decide the quality of a poem. In chapter 25, Badness in Poetry, Richards asserts that art would be ineffective if communication is defective or if the experience communicated is not valuable. Effective communication is the prerequisite if value in arts is to be perceived by the spectator. In chapter 4, Communication and the Artist, Richard says that art is a supreme form of communication even though communication is not his primary objective. The artist is engaged in making the work suitable for his readers. Richards asserts that individual minds are able to relate to particular experiences, but the process of relation takes place under specific conditions. There can never be the actual transference of or participation in the shared experiences. Communication is a complicated process that occurs when the mind of an individual acts upon another mind and effects a change similar to it. If art is recognized to be the ultimate form of communication, it follows that the artist is faced with the challenge of transmitting his experiences to the reader effectively. To achieve this, the artist must remain in a state of normality. No matter the amount of past experience available to the artist, he must be normal enough to communicate it. For effective communication, uniform responses that are initiated by stimuli are handled physically and they are required. The artist should be able to organize his responses otherwise it would be disastrous. After analyzing nature of experience and the essence of value, the importance of communication in the arts, Richards goes on to describe the three credentials of a good critic. According to Richards, the critic must first be able to experience the soundness of the mind so that he can criticize a work of art. Second, the critic must be able to differentiate experiences by analyzing their subtle features. Third, he must be an expert at judging values. A critic who is unable to pass sound judgments on poetry in spite of having these qualities is unsure of what exactly poetry is. Richard is of the view that one of the reasons of the poor quality of criticism 
S, the critic's inability to decipher what he is evaluating. The critic needs a definition of poetry that is practical. Richards considers poetry to be a group of experiences that differ minutely from standard experiences. This definition is more significant than calling poetry the artist's experience because it would mean that only artists possess experience. In Richard's view, the reader's involvement is necessary for the completion of the poetic experience. Richards is perhaps the only critic to have talked about the involvement of the reader. The principal areas under discussion in principles of literary criticism are experience, value, communication, poetry and the critic. The other matters taken for studies are analysis of a poem in chapter 16, rhyme and meter in chapter 17, allusiveness as a characteristic feature of modern poetry in chapter 28 creative imagination in chapter 32 and the two uses of language in chapter 34. The final chapter is on the poetry of T. S. Eliot, an appendix which was added to the second edition of the book in 1926. In many parts of the discussion on the poem, poet and imagination, Richards shows his allegiance to the theory of Coleridge. He agrees with Coleridge on the concept of imagination as a power that synthesizes and balances dissimilar qualities. The main principle behind the influence of arts rests on this fact. Principles of literary criticism assured a new dimension of criticism that the literary world had never been exposed to before. Every modern critic from the traditionalist like Lionel Trilling to a new critic such as Clean Brooks has been influenced by this work because of its penetrating study of experience, value and communication and its definition of poetry. Let us move on to some of the important discussions in principles of literary criticism in a nutshell. Richards attempts to establish a theoretical framework for criticism which would free it from subjectivity and emotionalism. He proposes a psychological theory of art. Art is valuable because it helps to order the impulses. He dismisses the concept of a special aesthetic taste. Aesthetic experience is similar to ordinary experience. Art experience is complex and unified. Art experiences do not merely have intrinsic value. It is possible to analyze art experience and examine its value in ordinary life. Value and communication are the two pillars upon which the theory of criticism rests. The arts are the absolute form of the communicative activity. Art is concerned with getting the work to embody the artist's experience. The mental processes of the poet are not a very profitable field for investigation. It is dangerous to try to analyze the inner workings of the artist's mind by the evidence of his artistic work. Arts can improve the quality of life by communicating valuable experiences. It is improper to consider value a transcendental idea. Metaphysical or ethical considerations should be kept out of literary criticism. He proposes a psychological theory of value. According to Richards, anything that satisfies the impulses is valuable. These desires may be conscious or they may operate at the subconscious level. The chief function of art according to Richards is to organize impulses. 
all these points being said, let us summarize what Richards had to say. Richards psychological theories have become obsolete with the passage of time. Moreover, it is difficult to accept the role of art in ordering the impulses of the mind. Richards was one of the first to indicate the importance of the response of the audience, but he did not investigate the role of the audience further. The critics of reception theory and reader response schools like Hans Robert Joss, Wolfgang Iser, David Blaich and Stanley Fish have analyzed the response of the reader and its value in criticism. Let us make a comparison now of the views of Coleridge and Richards. Richards is primarily a theoretical critic like Coleridge and he has indulged in literary analysis only as an illustration of a method. Coleridge is a poet who sacrificed every other interest out of obsessive love for poetry. Richards interest in poetry seems to convey the point that poetry is not an illustration of the aesthetic principles or data to provide experiments towards a theory of communication. Richards criticism is as abstract as Coleridge's, while Coleridge's critical pronouncements are filled with fervor and zeal, Richards critical stand is iconoclastic and anti-romantic. We will now summarize the entire session. Richards literary theory is quite original for his rejection of aesthetic, the resolute reduction of the work of art to a mental state, the denial of truth value to poetry and the defense of poetry as a power that orders a mind and provides equilibrium and mental health. Richards is unusual in combining interest in the response of the reader with scientific aims, but he makes a simple psychological view of the reader. The reader response school of criticism recognizes that the reader's cultural and historical situation is a crucial factor in responding to the text. The session has come to an end, but before we move on to finding out more about what Richards has to say, we have to answer a few questions. These questions would enable you to understand more about what Richards specifically meant to say in his principles of literary criticism.